Jenny Bevan is Oscar nominated for her work on Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris. I'm David Buchanan with Gold Derby. Um, Jenny, first, I want to congratulate you on the Oscar nomination for costume design. Thank you very much. I will say it was a surprise. I mean, I know people have loved the film because huge numbers of my friends have gone and interestingly, all ages and all genders, it seems to appeal to. So, and people like the clothes, obviously, but the whole heartwarming nature of the film is great. But actually, when you think of the heavyweight films that are out there, I really, really am completely thrilled that we have been noticed. You know, it, it's just great. Yeah, I wanted to ask you, you have many, many Oscar nominations and you've won uh, the trophy in this category a number of times. Just wanted to ask, how does this this film and this nomination and the recognition for Mrs. Harris feel different from, you know, uh, much of your other work? Well, I've been really lucky and actually the three times I have won it all for incredibly different films. And this is yet another very different in a way. And I think making it on, you know, a modest, let's be polite budget in COVID, in a city I didn't know, with a crew I'd never met before, in Hungarian, which is not the easiest language in the world. And an awful lot of them did not speak English, but you know, I got a guide, a phrase book and had a go, but can't remember any words now. Um, so I think all those challenges kind of, and and trying to reproduce a Dior show, when in truth, I had been told I'd be working alongside Dior and they would be doing the Dior bits. No, that wasn't quite how Dior had seen it. So, um, and bless them, they were incredibly helpful as far as they could be. And Justine, who came to Budapest with us and made sure, you know, it was all fine, uh, was absolutely wonderful and great joy to have around. But um, but basically we had to do it and, and I'm incredibly proud of that. Um, so yes, I, I, I think the whole thing is is really, really very pleasing and particularly for my crew, obviously. Absolutely. And we'll jump into the House of Dior uh, in, in just a bit and, and all the work you, you did on that. But I do want to ask you first, um, something that unites this film with a lot of the other ones that you've done is it's based on a literary work. It's, based on, it's, a, it's an adaptation of a novel. Um, sure. You've obviously worked um, with many, many, on many films that are based on novels, Ian Forster, um, Henry James, Austin, some wonderful work with Merchant Ivory. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you about your process when you're working on a literary adaptation. How much do you go to the source material for inspiration or do you just stick with the screenplay and the director's vision? What, what's your process? I, I do normally read the novel or the or whatever it's come from because I just but I try and only read it once and not stick to it because we are making as you absolutely said the script and the director's vision so um and in fact our script was quite expanded in terms of making it more difficult for her to get the money and and you know I think it was very good it, it added sort of layers onto it that certainly weren't in the novella and aren't in the Angela Lansbury version so it made it a little bit fresher and newer and a little bit more I think really good storytelling. Oh, absolutely, absolutely true. Um, the film also kind of depicts two very different worlds. We're in working class London at the beginning and, and the end and, and the middle at, at parts. And also, you know, obviously the upper echelons of society in Paris at the House of Dior. Um, let's start with the London scenes. What was your kind of approach and inspiration to costuming you know the background of working class London and also some of those main characters we have Vi and Archie and, and obviously Ada before she you know is transported to Paris so talk about your inspiration for for those scenes. Well in absolute truth I remember it because I was born in 1950 so I was seven in 57 and I remember a huge amount of London then. Um, we lived in Kensington bang in the middle of central London, a shabbyish area in those days, now, you know, millionaire time, but, um, and I saw women looking like Mrs. Harris often in the streets, and they always wore something on their heads, um, you know, that was absolutely de rigueur, that a woman would go out with either a headscarf or a hat, or whatever, um, but it, it was very, very different, obviously, to now, because we're way before the swinging 60s and all that, but it, it, it's quite well documented. I mean, there's some great photographs as well. Lovely um, scenes of London life and back, back streets and, and 
all the Mrs. Harris types. So it's not difficult to research, but also I just had a strong memory of going around on buses and it's terribly exciting when we went to the West End and, you know, with my father on the bus on the top deck and all that sort of thing. So it's it steeped in my in my psyche, really. Yeah, the film captures that that so well. Um, the kind of catalyst for the for the action of the film is when Ada sees um, a Dior dress in the house of one of her employers, um, which she terms the ravissant dress. Mm. Um, talk to us about that dress because it really, the audience has to be as endeared with it as Mrs. Harris to really kind of launch the film. What did you want that dress to look like and symbolize and, and show because it, it, how, it jumps off the screen uh, as it must? It was a real challenge, partly because nobody wears it. And for me as a costume designer, the garment, the clothing normally comes to life when someone actually puts it on. But this dress had to actually work as a as a prop. Um, and it also had to be totally believable that Lady Dant, who was cast quite late, and is a very, I mean, we always knew she would obviously be of a certain age, but we had no idea who it was going to be. Many names were, were battered about. Um, and of course, Anna Chancellor is very particular looking. I mean, she's beautiful, but she's very tall and she's stately. And this dress had to sort of be expanded a bit and lengthened, certainly, um, without it showing. Um, but obviously, when she holds it up to herself, you've got to utterly believe that she would have bought that dress. And it's not made for just a younger person or whatever. And also, Ada needs to also feel that love for it. And you can tell, I mean, she's wearing double floral at the time. So when she picks up the dress at triple floral, but it's it's just finding the story. And I think that's what costume design is all about. And that's what I do as a job. So our challenge on that dress was finding the fabric. And by that time we were doing it by remote control because I was already in Budapest, couldn't go backwards and forwards. My wonderful Sally Turner in London was dealing with finding fabrics, emailing, zooming, you know, backwards and forwards, trying different stuff under. Um, it, I mean, we, we actually did an Instagram post about it because it was quite interesting what we had to do. So um, it's sort of a miracle it happened. And then Felix Wiedemann, our wonderful DOP, lit it beautifully. So of course, you know, and the God of costume designers was ever present. Uh, I have a feeling uh, you were blessed on this film in a number of ways because you got to actually go um, and, and work with Dior and go into the archive. I just want to ask you about that experience because I have to imagine, you know, you've dedicated your life to costume design. What is it like to to kind of walk into history in that way and get to engage with the designs and the materials and the fabrics and really kind of witness and touch, you know, some of these these wonderful pieces from from the 50s? It was fascinating, um, absolutely fascinating. My family, we've never had anything to do with fashion. My parents are both classical musicians. They weren't very well paid in those days. They were brilliant musicians in big orchestras, but um, you know, they did not wear um, Dior or anything. And, and I've never had a great interest in fashion. I'm just a storyteller. So when it comes to fashion, of course, I'm fascinated if it's applicable to what I'm doing. And of course, Dior became very applicable and I got interested in him and the wonderful, um, again, research photographs. So, and they were, it, it was brilliant. So we went and obviously um, they have a big table in their sort of library room and they got out all the books and oh, you might be interested in this, Jenny, and have a look at this. And, you know, they couldn't have been better. We looked at what they've got, which isn't a lot. They did not keep much in the fifties. They did their collection. They sold it, they moved on. They didn't see any reason to keep pieces for archives. So there isn't much of the 50s in the archives, but Madame Schwazik Fapp, who's the chief archivist showed us um, what they had, which was beautiful. But again, it's lying in, you know, fabulous tissue paper and boxes and doesn't look, it needs to be on a body to really get the full, because the shapes are so particular with deal. Anyway, it was a brilliant afternoon, but it was the end of that afternoon when I thanked them profusely for, you know, the wonderful time we'd had and said how marvellous it would be to be working alongside them. And four horrified faces looked up at me from the other side of the table and went, no. And I thought, oh, shit. Um, and then I sort of recovered and I said, OK, fine. Um, that's OK. I mean, I do know people who can do this, but it will be expensive, um, you know. 
it won't be as expensive as making haute couture deal, but it will be expensive. So anyway, we did it and, and the results I'm incredibly proud of. You should be, and I, I wanna talk about one of those scenes in particular, which is the 10th anniversary collection showcase that, that Mrs. Harris attends. I mean, that is just an absolute, it, it's a magnificent sequence and it's a tour de force for your work because it's just, you know, piece after piece, they're, they're all stunning. I know some of them are based on, or many of them are based on Dior designs, but just talk about the process of putting that together because that's, you know, a dozen or more, you know, kind of couture, um, dresses that you had to put together for this sequence. It is indeed. Dior in the end lent us five outfits from their heritage collection, which is not original pieces, but are pieces they remade, possibly in the 80s or 90s, I think for a film, I can't remember exactly why. So we have five pieces. We found a real one in Cosprop. My costume um, is not mine, it's John Bright's, but it's I, it's my second home, Cosprop. Um, on, the, on the shelves, it was the costume, Puerto Rico one, I would say Costa Rica, um, the blue, and he had no idea he had it. I think it was quite a recent acquisition, came with a pile of clothes that people had donated. And so, and it had no inside and no label. We resurrected it, we, we remade the insides and Alba wears it and it's stunning. But the rest of it we made and I wanted to get color because obviously you can tell that Mrs. Harris would love color. One of the things we couldn't do um, because of COVID restrictions, shops not being open, not being able to just do the usual sourcing, was find anything with a with a pattern in it because nothing looked dear enough that you can that we could either find online or whatever. So I thought keep simple and just do excellent shapes in, in substantial fabrics, sculptural fabrics. And luckily both Jane Law, who made um some of them and John Bright at Cosbro, had in their um in their stock of you know fabric and we only needed one off so that was also an enormous help we managed to buy a bit of fabric um but it was a case of of just going with what we could find again it, and even the any embellishment on them was tricky to find it had to be what either of them had i mean there was no lovely wandering around shops at that moment in time so um basically it was getting the shapes and then obviously the models I mean, we didn't fit them, not until I got all the dresses to Budapest. I mean, it's not normal, this film. So we had to hope the measurements were good that had been sent from Hungary. And they were. I mean, we got away with it. They're things that probably should have been shorter or longer. Or, but, you know, we ha didn't have that luxury of of being able to. Even the French cast were um cast in Paris three days before they brought in quarantine. There's no way they could come to me and no way I could go to them. So there was a huge amount of um, interesting ways of working, which we made work. And, you know, I'm not going to complain about it. It just added to the challenge. Oh, I, I can't imagine. Um, it, but it does. I mean, you wouldn't know when you watch the film, obviously, how, how much effort. Yeah. Hopefully you, you don't. But I quite like pointing it out just in case anyone thinks it was easy. <laughs> Um, there are two dresses that Ada falls in love with at the showcase, um, Venus and Temptation. I just wanted to ask you about, you know, they're, they're very different and we have to, you know, see them through Ada's eyes and fall in love with them. Um, and obviously she ends up with her second choice at first. Um, but just talk to us about your inspiration and what you wanted to communicate and convey with those two very different, but both really stunning pieces. Well, number one, it has to be from her point of view. Out of all the dresses there, they have to be the ones she goes for. And in fact, they're the only two that have colour in them and that kind of shape, um, which was relatively deliberate. The red, I thought, was a wonderful colour that would suit her. It's based on an actual real Dior dress, but obviously that dress was, every sequin was sewn on by hand onto the fabric. We could not do that. We had to find something that would give that spirit. And we sort of did the thing of putting the soft tulle over the top, the silk tulle, which softens it and actually makes what was actually a relatively cheap fabric, but sparkly and and something Ada would fall for. Um, so that was obviously the one she really wanted, but no, she got the green. So the green actually had to also have stuff she would love on it. And I thought there was something slightly old fashioned and with the, the silver, um, 
it's you know an applique but sort of embroidery on it and and the color was was strong um which she would have liked and it was just playing around with what what would work i mean sometimes i think i should have done oh what do you always do after the event don't you, you always think oh if only i'd um but leslie loved that one she actually preferred that one to the red which was funny but um and loved the fitting um having it fitted on her on, on camera so that's the process it's all about when she saw the show the standout ones that she would fall for because i think some of the others are, are stunning but they wouldn't be what Mrs. Harris would go for. Absolutely. Uh, and speaking of color, I wanted to talk to you about some of the exterior shots of the film. Um, I don't know if those were shot. It sounds like they might have been shot in Budapest, but um, they're, they're so vibrant. I mean, we have that flower market, which is just beautiful. And we have the sunset along the river. I guess it's a, a stand in for the Seine, um, if not the, if not <laughs> the real Seine. Um, so just talk about how you kind of moderated your color palette to know you know what those exteriors were going to be i mean the flower market in particular is so vibrant so what did you want to do with the costuming on the characters in those settings well you're absolutely right most of it was shot in budapest there's very little actually in real paris or london and budapest is brilliant for standing into paris for paris because it's kind of the same architecture but a bit shabbier so it's got a wonderful 50s look um i think i don't really i'm very very instinctive with the way I work. Uh, I knew obviously there'd be colour at the flower market, but by that time, Mrs. Harris is wearing Andre Fauvel's sister, uh, who we call Sandrine. So she doesn't have a name, but we called her Sandrine. And I mean, what? where is Sandrine? Has she gone to a nudist colony, leaving all her clothes behind? Or uh, what's going on? Anyway, so what we had to do is make, um, and Leslie therefore, so we think Sandrine is also quite academic and wouldn't have very, you know, bright or anything clothes. So there's that sort of balance, but it's a bit chicer, i.e. more navy and cream than um, uh, the browns of London. I've done that. I mean, it's a typical one you do because London was brown in the 50s and Paris was more navy and white. You know, it was sharper. I don't know why they were they were occupied, but it didn't seem to affect them as much, whereas we weren't occupied and everything got terribly sort of, you know, post-war, which is how it is. But, but I tend to just work to the character and because the colours I will have chosen aren't going to clash with anything in a story like this, because it's that's not what it's about. There are other films you do where you're absolutely hurling colour for you know, almost a painterly effect, but that this film isn't about that. This film's about a woman who's going to work blooming hard to live her dream. Uh, and before I let you go, Jenny, I want to ask you about what you might wear to the Oscars. Uh, I know uh, in years past, you've kind of worn uh, outfits that pay homage to the film that you're nominated for, uh, Mad Max and Cruella in the last couple of years. Do you have any idea how you would incorporate, you know, the look of Mrs. Harris into what you'll wear to the ceremony? I am thinking about it. It's it's not as easy, actually, as Cruella. Cruella was really easy because I had so much to say and, and graffiti was part of the thing and I just love all that, being really irre irre irreverent. Um, I have ideas, but I haven't quite got them together yet. Um, so it won't, I think it will be much simpler, but I think there will be an homage. Um, but I won't be going quite so funky. I see, I cannot wear these. I mean, I look okay in trouser suit, particularly from the front. Don't look at me from the side. And, you know, I just not, I'm just not glamorous and I don't care. I want to be fun and I do want to pay homage to the film and our wonderful cast and crew. Well, it is always fun. I, I can't wait to see what what you'll wear. <laughs> um, best of luck at the Oscars. Congratulations again, Jenny Bevan on um, on Bevan on the wonderful work. Evan, yes, Bevan. it's Welsh, okay? Son of Evan, up Evan in Welsh. So it's always up Evan becomes Bevan. Well, congratulations, congratulations on the film. Uh, best of luck, and thanks so much for talking to Gold Derby today. Great pleasure. Lovely. Thank you. Mm -hmm.